So hello, hello everybody. I'm uh, Lucas Ferrand, founder and director of the international research platform SIM. Uh, it's so good to see that again, so many of you are out here, out there online with us for the second session now of the fifth symposium, following our opening session with uh, Jeffrey Baker's keynote and last week's first session on what motivates musicians to, to want to uh, engage in, in social and community music projects. Today, we're back at the Brussels Center for Fine Arts, Bozar. You can see the building behind me. The online activities of Bozar continue and the building will open again next Thursday. I want to again thank the Bozar team to make this online symposium possible, especially thanks to Raphael Le Monoyer and uh, Amber uh, de Munch, who are here with me running the show. During today's second of eight symposium sessions, we will focus on research which tries to come to a better understanding of music programs in detention contexts. Um, it's, it's the first of two sessions on, on, on this topic. John Speyer will chair today's session. After the short 10, 10 minute presentations of the three scholars, John Speyer will first have a panel discussion with them so that they can exchange some of their ideas and findings amongst themselves. And then during the Q&A following the panel discussion, I will be able to propose some of your questions to them. The Q&A will not be very long though, um, about 20 minutes. Uh, so I will surely not be able to introduce all of your questions. Uh, forgive me for this. Um, so um, as you can read also in the chat, um, your camera and audio have been muted and will continue to be muted throughout the session. If you have questions for the Q&A, please, use the Q&A button down below your screen, not, not the chat button. Your questions will only be visible for the speakers and moderators, not for the other attendees. I will be back later on. But before giving him the floor, let me first tell you what John Speyer is involved in. Besides being member of, of SIM's advisory body, body he's um, director of the UK organization Music in Detention. John, the floor is yours. Always best to unmute first. Uh, thanks, Lucas, for, for, for introducing me. And um, it's a huge pleasure to be chairing this, uh, this seminar. And, and I want to also to thank Lucas and everybody at SIM, both SIM and Bozar, for uh, what I know has been a, a great deal of work behind the scenes putting this all together. So um, here we are, and, and we have three uh, speakers um, for you today on the theme of music in places of, uh, of detention, or I think we'll say akin to detention. Um, and um, the, 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 the three speakers are uh, Alva Kenny from the University of Limerick and uh, Silke Marenison from the uh, Freie Universität in Brussels. Um, and then thirdly, Alessandro Mazzola from the Guildhall in the UK. I hope my pronunciation has been okay. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so without further ado, let's let's go to our first um, our first speaker, who is Alva Kenny. Alva, over to you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just making sure that you can see my screen. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Asylum seeker accommodation presents very unique and particular spaces in which to make music, but also to facilitate music making. These accommodation centres are where people seeking asylum are housed temporarily as they await refugee status. While the challenges and benefits of making music for those living within asylum seeker accommodation has gained increased scholarly attention in recent years, the experiences of the music facilitators who engage in this work has received scant consideration in comparison. And indeed, it was, it was great to hear John Svoboda just speak last week on this very topic. Today, what I want to do is provide some snapshots from an Irish context 
about the experiences of four music facilitators who delivered a group singing project across six asylum seeker centres, or as they're known in Ireland as direct provision centres. So uh, this project um, it's called the Song Seeking Project. You can get an idea there of the kind of geographical spread of the project. There is a lay research report um, that's available on this project that kind of covers all sorts of aspects of it. And, and I think that link will be in the chat. Um, just to give you an insight, all sorts of things went on in this project. That just gives you a flavor, that visual of uh, the various bells and whistles that, that, that occurred and the types of research methods and the types of events that took place and indeed the scale of it. For today though, I'm gonna just take a slice of this. I'm gonna look at the music facilitators experiences on this project. So through that data gathered through researcher observations, facilitator reflective logs and recorded professional development sessions, I hope to uncover some of the complexities dilemmas and indeed opportunities that working in such difficult contexts brings. The asylum seeking system and accommodation provided is fraught with controversy internationally. Ireland is absolutely no different in this regard. Some of these media headlines from the Irish, the Irish news will give you some sense of that. There are various political, economic, social, educational, cultural and indeed health debates are played out um, on a regular basis. Marginalised, segregated and bounded to asylum seeking systems, people live in what Saeed might call exile and, and uh, might live as exiles or indeed what, what Bauman might term as strangers in these temporary and transient accommodation settings. Therefore, any initiative or project that enters such a space are by their very existence then political in nature. From a pedagogical perspective, this type of work calls for a need for music facilitators to grapple with what Deborah Britzman would call difficult knowledge. She describes confronting such knowledge as a courage to explore the multi-dimensions of our desires and confront truths about ourselves and our world that can be very difficult to admit. Inherent within this is a call for facilitators to take professional and personal responsibility to engage in reflective practice, involving often a rethink about musician and teacher identity, expectations, approaches, ideologies, and indeed stereotypes. Gert Biesta relates that a true educational encounter is one that is open and therefore risky. For music projects within challenging contexts, such as asylum seeker accommodation centres, the stage is set for such a risky and open encounter due to both the unpredictable, but indeed the collaborative nature of such encounters. There are echoes here of Maxine Green to be heard regarding such dialogical encounters. She writes of opening up to multiple realities and narratives through aesthetic experience. Recognizing and understanding the other in such a way focuses attention to the specific context one is placed within, that one that embraces uncertainty and ultimately blurs the boundaries of a teacher-learner dichotomy. And just to move on, as I said, some snapshots really of some of the findings. The four music facilitators that were involved in the Song Seeking Project were professionally very, very well established. However, working within an asylum seeker centre was entirely new. Alongside high levels of enthusiasm were high levels of expectation. But of course, many contextual and systemic difficulties were encountered. And these were things like as you might imagine, gaining access, you know, finding suitable rehearsal spaces within the centres, difficulties such as poor communication with management, um, a high turnover of residents and, of course, mental health issues. After a few sessions, the facilitators realised they had to adjust their expectations, but also recognise that for many in the centres, singing was not an immediate need or want. In addition to attendance issues, there were the constant changing nature of the groups to grapple with too. So for instance, a facilitator might have built up a relationship with, with certain singers and next thing they'd arrive the next week and discover someone had already been moved, often without, with, with little to no notice. It became clear that the most important approach then was a flexible one. 
such aspects of starting a session on time, having a clear sequence of development, pre-prepared repertoire, sustaining the same group, all of that had to go out the window. And actually this, this gives you a, a kind of an insight into some of the facilitators thoughts on this. You can see from the quotes here, letting go from the court from the facilitators letting things happen organically trusting my gut as one of them says here trying to let go of things like timing and structure this letting go signals the response of ways of working adapted to, to suit the context and the singers and this wasn't always an easy process of course and indeed the reflective logs often showed a lot of struggles that the facilitators had in the spirit of Biesta's open and risky encounters as a means of informing new knowledge and understandings, the facilitators were repeatedly challenged to reevaluate their previous experiences, their tried and tested teaching approaches and prior knowledge throughout the project. Relating back to the writings of Maxine Green, she frequently argues that one takes risks when entering communicative spaces with the other and by engaging in such dialogue where nothing, as she says, stays the same. Adopting this lens, new, new knowledge was created relationally by actively involving the singers in the process, thereby expanding the professionalism of the music facilitators. In pedagogical terms, this was often involved the singers choosing the repertoire playing instruments alongside or indeed instead of singing, using more musical games than songs often, or indeed some sessions taking a songwriting focus. And to go with that example, the project did not set out to uh, involve songwriting at all, but rather that development came from the singers themselves. And in particular, two centres where the numbers were low really took this on board. So the facilitators really capitalised on very specific interests in those sessions. And this again gives you a little insight from one of the reflective logs. Julie got up from where she was sitting and went to the keyboard. She started playing some chord sequences that repeated and began to sing. It was lovely to see how she came into her own, getting lost in the music and the words. I discovered when she was finished that this was a piece she had written herself, titled As Long As You Leave, and she had included her own language alongside the English lyrics. When I discovered the chord sequence, I asked if she would like me to continue to play and she would sing, and so we did this. Addo left the room for a few minutes and returned with the ukulele. I gave him the chords and we all played and Julie sang. Nadir then turned the poof he was sitting on upside down and used it as a drum. Working in the Asylum Seeker Centre's deeply affected the facilitators in very- Alba, Alba yeah. just to let you know, you have about two minutes. Perfect. Okay. It deeply affected the facilitators. Invariably, as they built relationships throughout the sessions, stories and life experiences were shared, which were sometimes traumatic. Opening up such dialogic spaces was, of course, ethically complex, but it also demonstrated a very responsive mode of facilitation. Particularly where the numbers were low, singing and talking went hand in hand. And indeed, you'll see some quotes from the facilitators on that there, how they were affected emotionally. In conclusion, music projects have a tendency to declare victory narratives. And this is further heightened when such music projects are carried out with marginalized communities. The complex nature of working in asylum seeker accommodation settings facilitates or indeed promotes often the potential for heightening opportunities for othering. To address this, the music facilitators engaged in much reflective practice within the project. This was built in and supported through professional development workshops and through maintaining reflective logs. While they may have arguably engaged in reflective practice without such supports, the depth and frequency of engagement coupled with opportunities for shared reflection were undoubtedly of immense benefit. The research thus highlights that structures for professional development and reflective practice need to be embedded in such projects from the outset. All the facilitators had to be flexible in order to respond effectively to local needs and strengths. This often transpired as a letting go, or indeed as Andre de Quadros would talk about here in this quote, a dismantling of existing habits. 
promoting musical agency, being culturally responsive, attentively listening to the group, building relationships and participant led learning all emerged as essential to engage meaningfully with the project participants, whether they were adults or children. In some responsive and empathetic ways of working. Thank you, John, and thanks for the reminder. If anyone has any questions or wants to follow up, there's my email address. Thank you very much, Alva. By my timing, you were absolutely bang on 10 minutes. That was... <laughs> Thank you, that was fascinating. But I, we're going to keep discussion for, the, for after all three, um, all three uh, papers. So we're going to move swiftly on now to uh, Silke Marenison. So uh, Silke, let's, let's press straight on. Over to you. Thank you very much. OK. Okay. Okay, so anyone, everybody can see my presentation? Yes, okay. So I'm Silke. Um, I just recently started at the Participation and Learning in Attention Research Group at uh, the University of Brussels, um, and I'm going to give this presentation on the connecting power of music for prisoners from various nationalities, ethnic and religious backgrounds. And my colleague Flora, she's going to take part in the panel discussion later on. She just finalized her PhD on four national prisoners, so she's really the expert on four national prisoners and uh, prison participation. So imagine you are locked up in a prison in a foreign country, in a country you don't know, where you do not know anybody and you cannot speak the language or you cannot understand the language. In that context, music can have a connecting power. And around the world, there are many prisoners who experience being imprisoned in a foreign country. And these are foreign national prisoners. These are prisoners who do not carry the passport of the country in which they are imprisoned. And as you can see on the slide, the amount of foreign national prisoners has increased very sharply in Belgium over the last 40 years. In 1980, 21% of the total Belgium uh, prison population carried a foreign nationality. And this increased to almost 45% in 2018. And by that, we can situate Belgium far above the European average of 21%. It's even double as high as the European average. So despite this very high number of foreign national prisoners, there is little known about foreign national prisoners because they're often excluded from research. And when research is done, it looks more into their vulnerabilities. As some of you might know, prison, all prisoners experience pains of imprisonment, which implies that prisoners are deprived from their liberty, goods and services, autonomy, and so on. And international research has shown that foreign national prisoners are even more vulnerable and that they experience additional problems to these pains of imprisonment. For example, they experience language problems because they don't understand the language or they don't speak the language or difficulties in maintaining family contact because their family doesn't live in the same country as the prisoners are imprisoned in or uncertainties regarding residential status because they're not sure or if they can stay in the country in which they are imprisoned. So most research, research focuses on these additional problems, but little research just looks into their participation possibilities. And several legal instruments, such as the Nelson Mandela rules and European prison rules, they point at the right of all prisoners to participate in prison activities. And prison activities can be, for example, education or vocational training, but also music activities. So all prisoners have the right to participate in prison activities. But in practice, we see that foreign national prisoners have less the opportunities to participate in these activities. And this is mostly due to the language barriers that they experience. So for that reason, the FIP project was initiated and FIP stands for foreigners' involvement and participation in prison. The project started on February 2017 and it will end at the end of this month. And 
in this project, we did not focus on music specifically, but we focused on a broader interpretation of participation in prison activities. For example, education, prison work, sports, going to the library, but also music projects. And for this presentation, we will focus on the results related to music from two qualitative data sets. So first, 18 telephone interviews were conducted with all Flemish and Brussels prison activity coordinators. In each prison in Flanders and Brussels, there is a prison activity coordinator that coordinates and organizes the prison activities. And we wanted to get more insight in the activities that were available and accessible for foreign national prisoners. In addition, we also conducted 51 interviews with the foreign national prisoners themselves. And this was to get more insight in their experiences and needs regarding prison participation, social contact, social support, reintegration, and future perspectives. And these interviews were thematically analyzed. So once again, in the FIP project, we did not focus on music specifically, but uh, rather on a broader interpretation of prison participation and prison activities. But in the interviews with the prison activity coordinators, we heard several stories about prison activities that were accessible for foreign national prisoners. And within this data, we made a distinction between an individual music offer and a musical group offer. So at first, there is an individual music offer that's accessible for foreign national prisoners. For instance, prisoners can go to the library and in that library, they can borrow books, but they can also borrow CDs. But the foreign national prisoners experience these CDs as not adapt, adapted to their needs. For instance, this man, he says that the music at the library is more old music. And he also wants new music and that they provide more music just for white people. And that he wants, he wants to see that change because he also wants multicultural music as well. So next to this individual offer, there's also a musical group offer that's accessible. For instance, in one Flemish prison, they organize a multicultural week with several music workshops. And these mu music workshops are related to different continents. For example, there's a music workshop playing djembe or a music workshop beatboxing. And in these music workshops, language is less important, making it equally accessible for all prisoners to participate, e e including prisoners who do not speak Dutch. In another prison, there's a Gregorian singing atelier. And Gregorian is a language that no prisoner mastered, making it equally accessible for all prisoners to participate. Next to that, in some prisons, there's also the possibility to go to a concert in prison or to take up guitar lessons. And it's in these musical group acti activities that there is a potential to connect prisoners with various nationalities, ethnicities, languages, and religious backgrounds, and that can create a community. So this musical group of in this musical group of music can have a connecting power. And in the interviews with four national prisoners, they showed great importance to music in detention. For instance, this man, he went to a concert in prison and he said that going to that concert made everything less heavy and monotonous and it, it had a calming effect on him. It made him feel free and he didn't have to think. And he also says that these activities or going to a concert in prison is very important because it's very hard to be imprisoned in a prison in a foreign country. So, the findings of this presentation suggest that music can function as a medium to increase participation possibilities for foreign national prisoners. And this is because language is less important in the activities or since music projects are available in foreign languages, making it equally accessible for foreign national prisoners as well. And it's in these activities and especially in the musical group offerings that can bring, that can connect people from ver with various backgrounds, that can connect prisoners. And this is a connecting power that music can have. But despite the promising projects and activities that are already organized, the music offering prison is not completely adapted to the needs of foreign national prisoners. For instance, these CDs, they're not up to date. They provide old music and they want new music as well. And they also want more multicultural music as well. 
So the music offer in prison needs to adapt more to their needs as well. And we know in Flanders and Brussels, several music activities are organized in prison. But in practice, we know little about these activities. And little research has been done in Belgium about prisoners' participation in music programs. So more research is, needs to be done on this topic. And that was the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Silva. I didn't need to remind you that was you were under time. Fantastic. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. Um, a contrast then we have between um, the work that Al Alva talked about in asylum seeker accommodation, and, and then and then Silva's presentation about um, work for uh, music for foreign national prisoners and now we're going to go to our third speaker Alessandro Mazzola who is going to talk we're going to return to the realm of refugees and asylum seekers I think for this talk um, and then we'll have a, a, a dis bit of a discussion so Alessandro welcome and over to you thanks thank you John and just uh, share my screen trying to uh, Okay, and starting my timer. Okay, so uh, my presentation today is part of, um, it stems from a large uh, research project uh, um, conducted in, in 2017, 2019. It was about, it's a study of the relationship between local communities and newcomers, asylum seekers during and after the reception crisis in Europe, so-called reception crisis in Europe. And I was responsible for the Belgian field work and uh, with uh, an equipe of six researchers, <coughs> sorry, uh, we collected a, a big qualitative database of uh, uh, about almost 400 interviews and uh, uh, moments of uh, participant observation um, in involving migrants and non-migrants. And the migrants were, of course, asylum seekers, but also de facto refugees and undocumented migrants who had been uh, rejected by the asylum system and decided to stay in Belgium. A uh, bit of context of my case today, um, a music workshop uh, organized within the, the center of, uh, reception center of Namur, uh, where a very active and uh, large um, civil society organization called Collectif Citoyen Solidaire Namur was created when the center was, was opened actually in 2015. Uh, this group is a group, group of volunteers um, working uh, in coordination with the Red Cross, which is the um, state mandated actor uh, that manages the, the reception center. They do reception support, activity of support, but also language courses, French uh, language courses, professional workshops, um, uh, artistic and cultural workshops and leisure activities. and. Uh, I have uh, highlighted these two last uh, categories as participants include uh, the music workshop within these two uh, categories. They have big Facebook group, as you can see here, I was rejected when I tried to get in. So it's a controlled group, but it's quite large and very active, still very active. Uh, the practice, uh, so the music workshop, actually, um, there were two different programs. One was ended by the time I started the research and another one was ongoing. Uh, very um, very simple structure, uh, weekly sessions of one hour and a half to two hours over a three months period, uh, delivered by two musicians, conservatoire trained musicians. Um, very simple structure of the sessions, physical and vocal warm up, uh, writing practice in which participants could, uh, uh, I mean, it was a space in which they could express themselves by writing experiences and feelings. Uh, a break and uh, a moment of instrumental practicing in which participants could put their their lyrics, the the texts into into a song, uh, helped by the facilitators um, practicing the instrument or accompanied by them. The instruments available were uh, piano, uh, classical guitar, and different kind of percussions. Uh, the key points in the sessions were that no previous musical skills were required. Um, 
a degree of negotiation between uh, over the content of the workshop and the sessions between providers and the recipient and uh, some sort of public outcome, uh, which could be a small concert, uh, uh, a presentation of the project inside and outside the center. I, here's the detail of my participant. I'd probably skip this. Uh, um, yeah, this is, um, uh, well, I, I divided the presentation between the, the, the point of view of, of uh, uh, practitioners, so their motivation and, and objectives and the perspective of, of um, asylum seekers, which is the focus actually of my, of my study. Uh, in terms of motivation from the perspective of, uh, of the, the musicians, the practitioners delivering the, the workshop, I have uh, uh, identified two orders of motivation, which are, which are um, something that are, that, that's really shared uh, in, the, in the community of volunteers in the center. Uh, humanitarian perspective, so um, reacting to the state of emergency, which uh, became also, could be also articulated as a, as a sort of uh, 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 political and civic engagement. So um, in, the, in the objective of filling institutional gaps to governments, Belgian governments was, was criticized for not uh, taking enough care of the refugee question and only providing uh, first reception and nothing in terms of, for example, integration. Uh, and by doing so, uh, promoting a new paradigm of local integration. Uh, on the other side, the objectives of the music workshop in particular were um, personal and, and, and social interaction, all the personal objectives where uh, I, I could see this idea of uh, uh, providing participants with a space uh, for finding the relief from traumatic experience and also expressing uh, their, their emotional state. Uh, but also, and very, very importantly, probably the most important element that was remarked also um, uh, by, by, by all, uh, all uh, participants was this idea that uh, by doing uh, music, by participating to the the workshop participant could find a way to cope with the long waiting time and the the uh, uncertain uh, uh, outcome of their their application. Uh, on the other side, the 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 social outcome, social objectives were um, uh, something that I could uh, identify as an idea of uh, developing skills that could be used in the future uh, by doing the workshop and also finding some sort of uh, uh, visibility and uh, starting to get integrated in the local community, of course, by participating to the, the public uh, outcome, the public, uh, the concert or, or the presentation of the, the workshop. Uh, this perspective, uh, this perspective wasn't, wasn't often shared, wasn't shared uh, at all sometimes by, by participants. They, of course, identified important uh, reasons to sign in, to get involved in the, in the workshops. Uh, but they also remarked uh, several criticisms. They, they were quite, quite skeptical and sometimes very critical towards, towards the workshop. Um, and in particular, I've identified these three different dimensions. First, a perception of unequal access. And from this quotation, you can see that the participant says, that um, it, it was always the same people doing the, the workshop, not just that workshop, but also the other activities organized by the volunteers. So the perception was that regardless of the content of the activity, it was mainly the, 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 the interpersonal relationship the asylum seekers had with the volunteers organizing the, the activities that motivated them to participate. And this interview is interesting also because uh, the participant remarks this element of, of usefulness. So the fact that uh, that asylum seekers are in a particular situation in which uh, they have a strong objective, this brings uh, to the the second dimension. So this uh, idea of uh, of you know this utilitarian approach to the the the, the workshop. Uh, from this quotation, I took the the title for my presentation. It, I like it, but that's not what we need. <laughs> this participant said that the, the element for them, the motivation, the main motivation for them to, to participate in all the activities, not just the music workshop, is the possibility of increasing 
their chances to be accepted, to get a yes, what, what they call the yes. So a positive evaluation of their uh, asylum application. So the moment he personally didn't see this as an objective in, in, in continuing the, the workshop, he, he, he quit. And that was the case for uh, many participants. They either quit or were very critical um, towards the, the workshop. And this is, a, this is something that I have uh, remarked myself also as a researcher. The first question I got when I, when I in almost all my interviews was like, uh, what can you do for us? There was the, this idea, this thing, this imperative for them that, that uh, um, changed their approach, that affected their approach to, to all the activities they could, uh, they could do, including the music workshop. Uh, Alessandro, uh, uh, one we're minute. coming up to nine minutes. Okay. Yeah, I know. I have time or so. That's great. Yeah. That's great. That's last, great. last dimension, and uh, um, this is interesting too. This uh, quotations from an interview with uh, uh, an, uh, a de facto refugee, so someone who had participated in the previous workshop and now was was a refugee, and they remarked this difference uh, between the inside and the outside, saying that, uh, uh, um, saying that. For two reasons, uh, he found uh, uh, that the workshop had given a wrong kind of wrong, wrong, wrong uh, uh, idea of what the external world was, the external world to the, 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 the center. First, because um, uh, the volunteers had created a sort of protected environment that was uh, hard to find in the outside world. And the second, uh, second element was that he couldn't find in, in you know his motivation his own motivation and reason for doing music workshop outside because he didn't have the time he didn't have the resources or uh, or he couldn't find a reason for doing that well i have concluded although i have a lot of things to say about the research so i look forward to your questions and comments thank you thank thank you very much um alessandro thank you very much a smidgen over 10 minutes. Brilliant. All of you. Timing, fantastic. I wish I could achieve that myself. Um, so we've got uh, 20 minutes now um, to have a discussion between us. And I'm um, so we have all our three speakers. In addition, we have Flora Crooks, who is a colleague of Silkers at um, University in Brussels. So welcome, Flora. And um, thank you. So, um, I think I would like to start by asking you all a question about the uh, the effects of of this work, this kind of work, when it's working well. Um, we've heard we've heard you've done research into quite different settings, um, but um, unsurprisingly, I guess there are common themes that seem to come through in terms of the difference that the work can make, the benefits. That the work can have and then i want to talk a bit about the the challenge that alessandro has uh has brought to us about wh what about when you know when it, it doesn't work or when there is a there is a gap between what's intended and what's received if you like um but first of all i, I guess um um well, would, would would somebody like to start by saying what perhaps the common the common features are in terms of benefits from music activity? It's it sounds as if um, relaxation in a in a tough and uncertain situation, stressful situation, is certainly one of them. Yep, sure. Uh maybe i can i can start sure sure yeah Thank i, you, I have uh, um i've hi highlighted this element that uh, is coping with the long waiting time waiting time was the most uh, most stressful element for uh, for the residents of all the asylum seeker centers we have uh, approached and uh, conducted research in because it's something that uh, i mean they they sometimes have to stay for years uh, I have interviewed uh, asylum seekers in 2018 who had arrived when the long summer of migration started in 2015. So they had been three years in the reception center and uh, 
they had probably been rejected once and they could they have right to apply twice uh, so they were not so confident to be to be uh, mm. accepted to be to be um, mm. to be given Alva, the status did, of refugee Alva, did you did you find people in a similar situation to that in absolutely in um, yeah absolutely and and there there are very long uh, waiting times in asylum seeker accommodation settings in Ireland. There are people there up to nine years, would you believe? So, um, and, and indeed children who are spending parts of their childhood growing up in these contexts. And indeed, not just this research, but previous research I've done also uh, looked at music projects in these settings. And um, yes, it's about relaxation, but, it, but it's broader than that. It's about trying to improve the quality of life within these settings. You know, th these are very much spaces of limbo. They're spaces of waiting. And it's about trying to offer a means to improve um, the day-to-day the, the -day living in some way um, mm. does help in that sense when it's accessed. And that doesn't have to be, by the way, someone engaging in a music workshop. It also transpired in previous research I've done. It comes about through even listening to music, even just sitting in their bedroom listening to headphones can really improve their day and their mood. And um, so there's all of that. I mean, I think in a, another important aspect is about agency and that that music workshops can provide opportunities for agency to people who have very little agency. And um, so there, I've, again, in previous research, I found that notion of, of providing musical agency was actually hugely important for people who are living in this way. Thank you, Alva. I, I very much identify with that from the work I'm involved with in immigration detention centres in the UK. That agency is is um, perhaps partly partly for political reasons in a way, or at least there's a polit political dimension to it, because it is the sort of it is the political realm that has removed agency from people. So there's a strong political edge to the need to reclaim that, and we can do some of that in music sessions. I think, um, Silke, Flora. Does this does this uh, all sound familiar from a prison context? Do you think, or are there differences that you're observing? Um, yeah, it's it's definitely similar to to what Alessandro and Aibe um, had told us. There are um, yeah, several benefits for prisoners to participate in in, in music projects and in, in music uh, programs that Silken also um, presented in in, in the. The presentation they they attach a great importance uh, to participation music project because prisons are very monotonous. They know how their day would uh, look like, and participation participation in such activities could make yeah prison life more uh, less monotonous and 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 make it less uh, mm. heavy. Um, they also see it like something that fun. And, and, and it, it's something that also offers them agency, like uh, Albin uh, told us, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and Silke, do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I, don't, oh, I agree fine. with what Flora said. Um, yeah. I don't think there's much more to say. No. I guess to me, to me there's a diff and one difference that I see in the UK between immigration detention and the majority of prisoners, not all, but the majority of prisoners, is knowing when you're going to be out. And that does seem to have a really profound effect on how you get through and how you cope. I heard uh, someone who'd been in prison and then in immigration detention say once at a public meeting, in prison you count the days down and in, and in detention you count the days up. Um, and it seems that in immigration detention, the stresses and the tensions become greater rather than smaller as you spend more time there. Because perhaps the longer you're there, the harder it is to imagine getting out. So I wonder, does that, I mean, this is from, you know, I'm not a researcher, that's from, that's kind of how it looks to me as a someone in a practitioner organization, but does that kind of sound right? to you as researchers i know from from our research in 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 prison with foreign national prisoners that they are also dealing with a lot of uncertainty about when they are going their, to be their status 
yeah. yeah their their mm. status mm. when are they going to be released um if they're going to be released in their home country or in 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 in, in belgium when this will be so yeah they are definitely also um yeah facing a lot of uncertainty right right that perhaps the, the belgian prisoners aren't the belgian prisoners maybe know more about how that what the future might hold although i'm perhaps making bigger assumptions. yeah it's also yeah, related to their specific status as yeah. uh, foreign national mm -hmm. prisoners mm -hmm. yeah alva lots of uncertainty in your yeah, yeah. Settings, you, right? you yeah constantly so um so as i said i think that there are layers of uncertainty so there's the uncertainty that the participants have um uh, wondering when how long they're going to be still within the system are mm -hmm. they going to be allowed to remain in ireland or are they going to be deported Will some of their family, you know, we have children who were born in Ireland who still have the uncertainty of whether they'll be allowed to stay, despite the fact they're born in the country. So there's all sorts um, of uncertainty going on. There's the uncertainty, by the way, when refugee status is granted and they can move out of the accommodation setting, exactly. uncertainty of finding housing, which is another, you know, there's this immediate elation on getting out, but then that, that very quick fall of actually there's no housing for me. So there's all sorts that goes on there. And then, of course, for the facilitators going in, there, there was another layer of uncertainty, isn't there? Because there's the uncertainty, who's going to turn up? Is mm. anyone going to turn up? Mm. Um, every week the group was changing. People, you know, there was a core set of singers and then there was a peripheral group who came and depending on the circumstances of the day or evening, that day. So, sure. um, yeah. And that's just to highlight when working in these settings, the layers and layers of uncertainty go on and on. There's also the, by the way, the, the uncertainty of management, of access. When I arrive at the centre, you know, I have facilitators calling me going, they say I can't get in today. <laughs> so well, again and again, the difficulties just mount and mount when you're working. They, do. they surely do. Alessandra, do you want to say anything briefly about this before yes, I, I definitely kind of agree with the discussion? Yeah, with what what uh, Alba said, uh, because I think one of the main differences between a, a prison uh, and the context of an asylum seeker center is exactly that. Uh, uh, yes, they the asylum seekers they live in a condition of uncertainty, and uh, they definitely uh, long for going out. But there is also a sort of, uh, uh, um, I mean, I've remarked that they are often scared about. Uh, the future and uh, the fact of going out to, to, to the reception center, especially in those facilities where uh, volunteers were able to uh, build up a very protected environment and very, very uh, uh, comfortable sometimes, even if that's not the right word, probably a situation for them where there, there were many good services. I mean, Belgium did really well, civil society, in, in uh, uh, providing different services to, to asylum seekers. So there was also this feeling of, uh, I mean, I want to go out, I want to be accepted, I want to become a refugee, but I don't know what, I mean, as Alva said, I, I will be confronted with very difficult uh, uh, situation in which I'll be alone dealing with all, you know, uh, mm. new, mm. and the way they, they sometimes, some, some of them, they f feel unprepared to the outside world. Uh, mm. Uh, mm. And that's interesting. And that, 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 that's a great um, sort of link back to the other issue I wanted to raise with you all, which is the sort of the, the kind of challenge in your presentation, the, um, the this uh, example that that participants that you spoke to um, were saying, well, this isn't like it's going to be out in society, you're, exactly. you're, you're misleading us or some something like that. And so th and that was one of the one one of one element of of what seemed like quite some quite quite sharp quite sharp disjunction maybe to some extent between the motivations intentions of the people running the activities and the and the the needs and and um and aims that that the people being invited to participate expressed for themselves and so that brings us to the question of well i to term it to sort of phrase it broadly maybe we could say the relationship between people kind of running organizing or uh, and delivering activities and the people for whom they are designed it 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 feels like and um, so silver silka in your 
in your in your paper you said you said that there were that that one of the findings was that the provision was not really in all respects suitable for foreign national prisoners there were questions about genre and repertoire if i understood you correctly and alva um you talked about um the the way that the practitioners had to really uh, abandon their previous practice to some extent their plans and and respond and, and i think if i understood you correctly that was not just in response to things that were to do with the way the setting ran but also it was a response to 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 the the needs of and interests of participants as they were sort of discovered on the day in the room in the moment by the party so so we have here different ways of connecting the two diff and some something uh, so 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 i suppose my question is what what does it take what 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 will what will get us the best efficacy here in these activities how how do we need to structure how do we need to provide for what kind of a relationship do we need to create between the different people involved in these sessions so that we don't get that that gap, uh, that that failure to meet need, if you like. Can I jump in? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I I am. Um, I mean, okay. I, I I'm. I see this in a in a few different ways. Firstly, um, I think you've hit the nail on the head in saying it's about building relationships and and as I talked about being responsive to what's in front of you. I think that's hugely important, and I think there's a lot of skills that can be developed in order to respond to the people in front of you. It's a little bit the same as sending a teacher out with a curriculum for, for third class or third graders, whatever you want to say it, and saying, teach this. <laughs> but of course, every third class looks, is depending where it is and who's in it. Um, so, I mean, I think it's the same thing. I think you can have your bag of tricks and, and your prior knowledge and your experiences, but actually, what you have to do in front of you may require something much more flexible and, and adaptive. Having said that, I think that some of those gaps that, that you made reference to can be avoided. It can be avoided through consultation with people on the inside, for want of a better word. I think it can be done through um, uh, making very concerted efforts to get leadership from within. I know that in the song seeking project, we used a lot of support organizations outside of music alone to try and connect us with what we would call key stakeholders within the center. So these are people who are already, you know, showing leadership in all sorts of ways. It could be in relation to food. It could be in relation to, you know, all sorts of, of issues, employment, etc. But yet these were the people who, who again and again took up leadership opportunities were kind of key leaders in the centers and where that happened, where those people really took on the project and communicated very regularly with the facilitator, those projects in those centers were much more successful than where that wasn't in place. Thank so I think you. there can be a lot of groundwork done before mm -hmm. the facilitator ever even enters the space to kind of set up those structures. Thank you. Who'd like to come in next? Like, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, in our research group, we also did um, research um, not on, on music in detention, but in the context of an European project on prisoners' active um, citizenship. And um, yeah, there we saw that it's yeah very important if you want to set up an, an activity and once that it, it's successful in prison that it's supported um, and and. By, by all actors involved in, in prison, like prison governors, prison officers, activity organizers, and, and prisoners, and that uh, they are all involved and definitely that it's yeah, important to involve uh, prisoners in, in setting up um, those activities so that it's yeah, really supported and, and, and adapted um, yeah, to their needs. And also the, the, the importance of the, of the, of the rights uh, facilitator also, um, yeah was something uh, very important if you want to set up something and wants to be uh, successful. Mm, mm, mm. Matching, matching the, the, the practitioner to the, to the setting, the people, the individuals, the. Yeah, something, yeah. Yes, yeah. Someone who also can 
search for the support and, and, and can try to involve them and mm -hmm. and motivate also the, the prisoners to participate. That's mm -hmm. yeah, very important. From a kind of practice point of view, I I think that's a really key thing. Um, I haven't got my evidence base, I'm afraid, but but it, no, it feels very key. Um, and it's a somewhat intuitive uh, decision as well. You know, a subjective decision. But uh, Silke, do you want to add something? She said it all. No, I think she said it all. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Great. We think alike, so it's hard. Yeah, yeah, to... yeah. You're a team. You're a team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, thank you. Um, Alessandro, do you want to? Yeah, I definitely agree. Yeah. And um, yeah, one of uh, uh, um, the, the most important element that I have remarked is um, a gap in the in the way in the way practitioners, the musicians, were prepared to uh, work with uh, that specific population in the center was the fact that they weren't uh, really uh, prepared about cultural diversity, that kind of cultural diversity, and ethnic diversity. And this was, for example, an element in the perception of the unequal access I've mentioned. Because, mm. um, uh, of course, the reason sometimes, the, the reason for participant to get involved was their contact with volunteers and the, the, the facilitators themselves. And this contact was based on uh, cultural proximity, uh, sometimes based on language, of course, was was key uh, element, but also the fact that they had uh, done uh, activities maybe outside the center, they got along, they, they, they could be uh, not just culturally, but also, mm, mm, well, let's say, uh, uh, they have a daily interaction, some sort of uh, uh, connection that was uh, uh, beyond uh, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and represented uh, sometimes the motivation to sign in, but also a source of uh, frustration for other residents in the center that looked at uh, this uh, selected group of, of residents as a privileged group uh, doing all the activities. Mm. And, uh, um, so yes, I, I would have uh, loved some, some sort of uh, attention to these uh, um, to different cultural 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 mm. uh, views and and approaches uh, in order to try to involve to involve uh, uh, as much uh, people as possible and to have a more uh, democratic access to the activity mm. um, it feels it feels like a we're talking about the need for structure really mm. you know i think it feels like there's you know as opposed to we rock up and we do a music session you know it's what's the meaning of what happens in the music session is is can't be separated from what happens kind of around the music session the of the course, setting the context the all of the all of the things that are sort of around it um so we have to pay attention to how the thing will work in the setting and you know like who will take part and who won't and what 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 it will look like, what it will, um, where it, where it will be, who, how it will fit into um, the setting, and and then another bit, of, another type of structure would be your point, Alva, about um, reflective practice, so that we're, you know, learning, so that learning is going on, and with it the ability to to adapt more even to attune, to tune in even more finely to 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 the situ to the circumstances yeah if you can i jump in john just as a comment on that i mean i think um thinking about positionality is is important in this as well and, and anyone going into these projects to kind of interrogate their own positionality and where they're coming from and and you know that can be quite embodied and and just as an aside, um, you know, uh, uh, there's actually a book chapter coming out soon on this, but um, previously I've published on, on, on looking at how, when I was a music facilitator in a previous project in one of these asylum seeker centers, I was pregnant. And how mm. me being mm. pregnant affected the response that I had within the, within the center, the access that gave me, how that attracted more women actually to yes. partake and um, yes. how then it excluded men. So there was both that in exclusion piece simply because of my physical body. Mm. 
So I think there's all sorts of, of, of very complex considerations in, in, in this yeah. type of work and lots of things to consider when you're walking into these spaces. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I that was such an interesting discussion. I'm grateful to you all, thank you so much. But I think we have to, we're running slightly over. Lucas, apologies. But I think um, it's time to hand over to you for the Q&A. Good. We have some really interesting questions. Um, let's start with, uh, yes, uh, a question with which comes back uh, both from John Sloboda and Yanis um, uh, Miralis, which is about the um, uh, what what are the the necessary attributes qualifications uh, which are really necessary for such facilitators musicians doing these projects in uh, in this context and um, did they do they need special specialized training um, also John Soboda is wondering whether um, for the project that Alva presented uh, whether uh, these facilitators had uh, previous experience elsewhere uh, before uh, being involved in, in, in the project that uh, uh, in detention that, that was studied. So about, yes, um, yeah. the, the attributes, qualifications, training. Yeah, so um, what, uh, so because I myself had had previous experiences of being the music facilitator myself, this project and the funding allowed me to, to, to kind of be just the researcher and project manager and facilitators to take it in a new direction. Because I'd had that previous experience, I knew of the types of, I suppose, skills and, 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 and indeed um, attributes and thoughts and understandings that were needed, that helped. So what I did was, is I set up professional development workshops for those four facilitators going in. Um, and as well as that, because it was being researched, they kept reflective logs. Now, even though I was keeping those reflective logs for research purposes, they actually proved to be crucial as a form of reflective practice for the facilitators as they journeyed through the project, because it really forced them to sit down after every session and really interrogate, how did that session work, not work, et cetera. So, and, and, and as well as that, because there were four of them, that was important because there was this shared sense we're all in this together and a sense of camaraderie and dare I say it community of practice where they all would have communicated regularly with each other too into what was working, what was not working and why. Um, so all of that helped. Now, as regards what did they come with, these were, I mean, this is important to say, really, really well-established facilitators, the four people. They were, um, they came onto the project through a competitive um, process. There was an open call for facilitators. We had a lot of applicants. People were very interested in engaging in this work. So they were selected based on, on the wealth of experience they did actually bring. And these were people who had been engaged in, in, in social, social projects in varying, varying, varying circumstances, not within asylum seeker centers, however, because this is quite new work in Ireland. Um, so they still struggled. They still struggled and their reflective logs reveal that. They, they really struggled every step of the way. So what I'd say is, is that, yes, we provided professional development workshops. Yes, they had the reflective logs. But even now, looking back, I feel they needed more. I feel that I would have given them even more professional development workshops, more structured um, opportunities for engaging with each other you know, because often it just came down to email exchanges and phone calls, but I think there could have been more face-to-face -face interaction in that sense. Um, and I think that regardless, actually what was interesting was the four came from different types of backgrounds. Some, you know, we're talking about conservatoire trained, others completely steeped in community music training. There was a variety and it didn't matter. They all struggled. So um, what I'm, my, my point being is there need to be supports put in place right from the outset and alongside the development of projects in order for the music facilitators to gain um, a huge amount of professional um, types of professional gains, but to influence their practice in a meaningful way. And obviously in turn, for that to be of benefit to the participants.
anybody else wanting to react to this question? Um, my maybe I can I can jump in. Uh, I think my case is much less uh, structured than the one of uh, Alva, my 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 group of uh, of uh, practitioners, musicians. Uh, they were volunteers and. Uh, the, the civil society organization, the collective worked with the principle of the mobilization of skills. This means that uh, um, volunteers were asked to put their expertise to the service of the reception center and uh, the, the, the asylum seekers. So it was much, much less structured. There was no call, no selection of, uh, of, um, of facilitators, etc. But what I've uh, to go, you know, to respond, to try to answer to the question um, that was asked. I think one key element that was missing in the preparation of uh, practitioners was um, a knowledge about uh, the real uh, needs and the profile of the people they were working with, the target group they were working with. On the one hand, some they, they missed, uh, they, they, there was some, 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 um, in my opinion, my view, a need to, to be more prepared about the ethnic background, the diversity and uh, the, the, um, the specific situation uh, uh, and uh, um, the, 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 the history of migration that was behind each of the participants. And uh, on the other hand, a lack of knowledge about uh, the, the, the procedures these people had to face and to go through and so um, it, it, it was not clear for, for the participant in the workshop the way that activity could actually help them uh, uh, if there was, there was a way. Uh, um, so the, I, I think this element was missing in the, in the, in, in the preparation, in the background, in the, in the knowledge of the, of the facilitators, more sensibility to the, 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 social, the social element um. Yes, so I, I go to a, another question from Imogen Flower. Um, it's a question about activism, in fact. She's, um, she's um, asking the, um, to what extent uh, do you think that musicians and organizations and uh, maybe also people doing research, working in a detention context, have a responsibility for critiquing the conditions of these institutions and systems. Your reflections, your, uh, your findings maybe uh, from, from, your, from your work, as, uh, from your research. That's a very good question, if I can uh, start. I'm sure, uh, be, I'm sure it will be uh, very much uh, discussed next week. Uh, yeah. I know that the group of next week with Mary Cohen will be, uh, they're very activists, so uh, activist group, but I think it could be interesting to, that you already also give your thoughts and uh, findings. Yes, that is can, can go on. Yeah, um, in my case, it was quite clear that uh, um, not just not only the, the the music workshop, but almost all the activities implemented by the volunteers were um, were um, done within this idea of being uh, of representing some sort of uh, um, criticism towards the the government and the way it was managing the the refugee question. Uh, as I said in my presentation, was this idea of uh, 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 sometimes replacing the state uh, in providing services that were very important and weren't uh, provided by the, the state-designed actors. But also, uh, as I also said, um, this idea of uh, promoting, making visible a, a different idea of integration that was really grounded within the local community and uh, sometimes it was articulated in opposition in contrast to the idea the general idea of the 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 belgian state in that case concerning asylum and uh, the refugee question so uh, so to promote local paradigm uh, of integration that was uh, and also that was something also structural that i've, I've been cases of uh, uh, I've, I've had cases of volunteers doing activities in the centers uh, claiming for uh, like uh, some 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 um, tailored structural support to local community instead of like going 
uh, uh, in, 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 in asking for larger uh, funds. They want to, the, the money to, 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 get, to be given to very specific localized activities that were completely uh, uh, probably opposed in terms of uh, uh, um, approach to the refugee question to the, the, the official institutional view of the Belgian state. So definitely the uh, activism perspective was uh, uh, evident and clear in all the activities, in including the music workshop. Any yeah. other reaction, uh, remarks? Yes. Yeah. Thank. Th thank you. Um, I. Um, well, I think, as 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 stated earlier, I think even stepping into these contexts that are are marginalised and segregated from society, they're often uh, geographically in very rural and isolated places too. By the way, and that's very much on purpose. I think even entering the space is a political act. Um, I know in our song seeking project, um, we had, actually this resonates with a lot of Mary Cohen's work, we had um, singers um, in the surrounding communities come in and join us for singing sessions, what we called sing-ins. So again, these were people living locally who had never set foot inside an asylum seeker centre, had never met with these people who were living in their communities actually coming in. Again, quite a political act bringing those people from the outside to the inside. Also a political act that the residents in the centres were acting as hosts. So there's various layers to this. We also went and took the project to the National Concert Hall in Dublin um, at the end of the project in this big celebratory moment. That was quite contentious, by the way. The music facilitators largely did not want that. They didn't like the idea of a public performance. They were afraid of it. There was all of these kind of preconceived ideas about what should be in a national concert hall and the elitist nature of that. But again, the project going to a national elitist stage, a macro political statement. And what was wonderful was, is the asylum seekers used that stage. They used it as a form of resistance. They used it for a way to be visible on a national stage. Not only that, they went a step further. In one of the songs that they wrote themselves, it was highly political, the song they performed on the day. They made reference to people taking their own lives in direct provision, which had happened in, very, in weeks leading up to that performance. So it was very on topic. We attracted, you know, um, uh, RTE, which is like, um, I hate to always be using UK references, like the BBC. <laughs> I know that everyone knows that. But you know, they came with their cameras. We were on the national news that night, you know, to every home in Ireland. Again, don't underestimate how, how activist those acts are and what a polit political statement that makes. So I hope that gives you an idea of the levels of, of, of the political nature that these projects entail. A very different question comes from uh, Peter Churchill. Um, within prisons, uh, he says his experience is that one of the biggest challenges is getting prisoners to sign up for music groups and uh, music uh, programs uh, or opportunities. And uh, he wonders whether there is any research uh, or any of your experience, research experience that relates to the uh, to effective ways of reaching and inspiring prisoners to to get involved in uh, in music pro programs. Um, yeah, we know from research that um, yeah, often written announcements of, of yeah, activities in general, including in music activities like flyers and brochures, are often yeah, not enough. And we, we see that in, yeah, like also in our research with foreign national prisoners, that the verbal announcement is, is very um, important. Really going to the prisoners and, and, and informing them about the, the participation possibilities, about possibilities to, to participate in, in music groups and, and, and opportunities is um, yeah, actually very um, important because you can not only inform them, but also motivate them um, to participate in, in those um, uh, yeah, prison activities. And we see that not only activity providers uh, plays an important role in, in informing um, prisoners verbally about the um, activity offer, but also peers, actually fellow prisoners, also um, play an important role in informing and motivating prisoners to participate in, in prison activities in general or including um, music um, activities. So the, 
the verbal announcement of, of yeah, the, the prison activity is actually very powerful um, to reach um, yeah, prisoners. Anybody else wanting to react to this question, remark? No, I think Flora, correct me if I'm wrong, I think um, in, in our um, research group we did research on motives and barriers to, I'm looking at Flora, but she's mm -hmm. drinking, okay, to participate in activities in general. So it's not specifically on music activities, but more uh, in general. So I don't know, maybe that's interesting. I have a specific question to um, Alessandro uh, from Jane uh, Bryant. Um, um, so uh, Alva and John, um, um, uh, you spoke about the development of agency through uh, music uh, participation, but then Alessandro reflected that the uh, asylum uh, uh, seekers couldn't see the benefit to them in uh, participate of participating in music making and saw it as something that that they saw it as something that would be for the for the facilitators uh, 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 something of interest and doing them a favor uh, rather than for the asylum seekers themselves. Um, her question is uh, how did the music facilitators then address this um, in um, in your research, Alessandro? They didn't. Um, that's an interesting question because uh, I, I, I found different, uh, uh, different situation than the one described by uh, Alva. I didn't, uh, I didn't find this element of agency in the, in the, in the music workshop uh, from the part of uh, asylum seekers, of course. And this, I think, for two reasons. The first and main, re main reason is that uh, uh, there were many other activities that were based on the agency, on the fact that uh, either uh, uh, local community members or uh, the, the asylum seekers themselves wanted to, to, um, to, to act uh, and do something. Uh, for example, uh, the political uh, representation of the, the issues, etc. So the music workshop was perceived as something very different from that. And uh, um, uh, I'm not saying that participation was passive. I mean, the, the, the quotation may be, the, the, you know, the thing said by the, the participant that uh, he had the impression of doing a favor to, to uh, the, 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 the practitioners was probably an extreme uh, opinion. Uh, but yes, there was no, no, I mean, I think this is also a, the, second, the second reason I, 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 uh, I think is due to the, the approach of uh, of many volunteers that was quite uh, uh, paternalistic, I would say, uh, mm, and uh, and so uh, there was some sort of depoliticization of this context, including the the music workshop, uh, in which I couldn't really see uh, the element of agency, nor that element was addressed by by the the, the facilitators, uh, and that's why probably wasn't really successful because. Um, the, the participants couldn't see, you know, a, a reason, you know, a, an active, uh, a proactive reason doing, uh, for doing the, the, the workshop, for being involved in that uh, activity. But, um, Lucas, could I chip in here just for a second and say, um, I think that music activities can offer opportunities for agency, but I don't know whether we really know whether when people choose to join those activities, they're doing so with that specific intention. Mm. I suspect that in many cases, they're looking, to, they're looking, they're not thinking specifically of agency. They might be thinking of other things like I like music or I want to do something that'll make my day less heavy or boring mm. or whatever it might be or music is my as people have said to me music is my therapy you know they say things like that sometimes but agency can be sought in other ways and you know in our work people who come to music sessions may also be being very uh what's the word very proactive in in pursuit of their own case 
so they're exercising or attempting to exercise agency in that way and i think there's a the the, the setting that alessandro researched there's there's maybe a difference uh, comparing it to the other two settings that our speakers presented there's maybe a difference between somewhere where you might have somewhere where you are in in a very um you may you may have arrived very recently or you may although you haven't arrived recently still see yourself in a kind of in in a in a sort of in between kind of state and your overriding you know wish is to get out of that in between state whereas in an institution in a prison in a asylum seeker accommodation i wonder if you know there's a certain stability in 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 the daily life and so one looks perhaps more for part for things to pass the time so the form ones you know so agency can be kind of sought in different ways um and in the case of music activities i think we can sometimes kind of sneak that in it may not be if you know you don't necessarily put come and develop agency on the poster right but you kind of sneak that in because you know that that's something that will bring a psychological a social psychological benefit thank you john um uh, there are other questions interesting questions but time's up so um Thank you so much, uh, John Speyer, uh, Flore Crooks, uh, Silke Marinissen, Alessandro Mazzola, and Alva Kenny for your precious contributions today and on music programs in detention. Next week, Tuesday, the 2nd of February, there will be a second session on today's subject. That session will be chaired by Mary Cohen and will be presenting research on music in detention by researchers and practitioners also from Brazil, Germany, the US, Belgium, and the UK. You can find all the details on, uh, on next week's and, and all other sessions on the websites of SIM and the website of Bozar. But you can, in advance of the upcoming program, also listen to our SIM podcast with interviews with those chairing the panel discussions. And um, the podcast can, uh, can easily be found uh, uh, because many different directories propose it already uh, online. The upcoming sessions will be all very similar to today's session. They will last uh, uh, for about one and a half hour. They will start with presentations of research followed by a panel discussion with those who just presented their research. And then there will be time for a Q&A allowing you who attends to be active as well. I want to, uh, I'm looking forward to see, to see or hear or read uh, you uh, the coming, the coming time and uh, we're, uh, we're the coming weeks and uh, I just want to say goodbye and uh, thank you for everybody else uh, being with me out there. Yes. Bye.